morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Great. I tell you what, let's get this out of the way. We, we kind of fret with this a little bit. Why don't you stand up? Only two people. Well, no, okay, let's go three because we're Trinitarian. You shake, elbow bump, or make eye contact and say, I'm glad you're here. All right, let's take just two minutes and let's say, let's welcome each other in Christian love. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are here. (laughs) Glad you're here this morning. God bless you. Doing well. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. All right, has everyone hit their three people, not hit, greeted their three people? All right, you may be seated. If you've greeted, that'd be a good time to sit down and relax. I know it's a taxing work to say hello to some people. We just want you to uh, know that there are boatloads of stuff that's happening at the church, and, uh, and, and we continue to uh, enhance and grow the ministries as we're trying to reach our community. Uh, that's what we're here. We're, we're here as a beacon of light for Sunbury, the village of Sunbury. And we need people to watch and look out and say, hey, there's a need, and uh, can we meet it? Can we help? And, uh, and so we need to focus in on our community. And we, have as a staff, have been doing that and working on that uh, diligently. And so I pray that you'll be a part of this movement and uh, invite you to be a part of this movement. Also, uh, I want to give you a heads up that uh, we are starting our stewardship campaign. And, uh, and, and I've not done this before it's at SUMC. We came, and uh, everything was in place, and, uh, and then COVID hit, and we never really got a chance to put a campaign. So I don't know what you do. I mean, do I show up at your house with a offering plate or do I no? okay I'm seeing a notice to that one you know do I do I call you on the phone and say hey pony up <laughs> I'm just saying we're going to learn a little bit about what it means uh, to really be part of God's family and to know that God is with us and walks with us and guides us now I want to take one more moment of privilege before we worship and and uh, I found out just recently that uh, some of our members, this is reunion time and so on and so forth, that was at a reunion. And then uh, Pam told me that she visited a church. Pam, why don't you come up here a second? That, right here, that way you can, they can. Okay. So Pam, Pam was, it was a reunion you were at, right? Right, yeah. Okay, and, uh, and so she went to this reunion and I'm telling you, what warms my heart is that while she was, she missed a Sunday here. But, Do not judge. <laughs> but she went to church, and then she told me about this experience. And I, I, th- I think it's so great that um, I, I want to share it with, uh, with you. And Pam, you correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, because I want to use I want to use as much as what you told me. But she was at this reunion. She went to this church. It was a small country church, and uh, and she was there and was worshiping, and uh, and was just totally being being taken in with their love and with the grace of God that was there, and uh, and, and they the, were singing. I mean, it was like oh, praise the Lord, Jesus. <laughs> Amen, <this> hallelujahs. <laughs> it was. Whew, I got into it pretty good. <laughs> well, she got into it so much so that when the sermon was done, that the preacher said, is there anybody who has a need that would like us to pray? Isn't that really a novel idea? And you never guess who went up, our meek and mild Pam. Went up. What did you ask for, Pam? Um, the pastor said, Pam, what can I pray for you for? And I said, um, just pray for my hearing. Okay, and so what you told me was that, that uh, he came over and he put his 
hands like this, and he kind of shook it a little bit mm -hmm. and said the prayer and said to open her ears and went, Choo. like this. Boom. Okay, boom. And, and then he asked you a question. He says, how's your hearing? I said, well, it's not for another couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have the benediction. Oh, no. <laughs> now. Since you've got it all out of you, would you please worship with us this morning? Please join me in the gathering. It is responsive. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh, merciful Creator, we are here to open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us always thankful for your loving providence. And grant that we, remembering the account that we must one day give, may be faithful stewards of our good gifts. For Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please join us in standing as you're able and sing with us, River of Life.
Old Testament reading is from 1 Kings, a reading from prophet Elijah from the book of 1 Kings. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replies, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Here's what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. And then our New Testament reading is from Matthew 25, 23. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. And now, please join us in singing, raise a hallelujah. And I don't want to do it. is a melody 
you may be seated. Figure this out every time that Joy says, You may be seated, I have to stand up. <laughs> well, my friends, there's one type of sermon that no pastor ever wants to preach. And the reason is it bugs more people than any other topic. I mean, Let's be serious. It bends people out of shape. And that's when the preacher talks about money. Hmm. That's right. Uh, some who are of the King James persuasion would call it good, a right, good, old, filthy lucre. Now, mind you, the preacher can talk about adultery, and, and that's not a problem. Everybody, yep, 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 yep. Uh, I, I, can, I can preach about stealing. I can preach about murder. I can preach about lust. And it's kind of like, yeah, that's okay. I, those, are, those are in the Bible. That's, that's a good topic to talk about, Pastor. And, and the preacher can even preach about cigarettes and whiskey and wild women. And the congregation will cheer them on. You go, Pastor. You save those sinners. But let the preacher talk about money. Well, then. We're meddling, aren't we? I'm like you. I don't like a preacher ever begging for money any more than you do. But this is the fact. Fourteen chapters. Now, mind you, that's all creation of the world. That's, I mean, it's not very long before we're introduced to a tithe in the Bible. Fourteen chapters. And that's when, when Abraham gave Melchizedek, that mysterious king who was considered to be a priest of God, 10% of all that he owned. Mind you, he was away from home. He was traveling without a credit card, if you can fathom that. In the first book of the Bible, the tithe is mentioned. Now, in the last book of the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, it's mentioned again. So the, the, the law and the prophets, when they put together the Torah for God's people, the children of Israel, God's chosen people, the beginning of the book on how God wants to deal and work with us as God's people, and the end of the Jewish scriptures talks about money. And we say, that's okay, that's Old Testament. That doesn't, doesn't deal with us. But I'm telling you that Jesus in the New Testament spoke more about money and how we use money than he did about, now listen to this, he talked more about money than he, than he did about prayer. Can you fathom that? He talked more about how we should view money than he did about studying God's ways. He even talked more about how we should view what has been given to us by God than our eternal state, heaven or hell. God talks more about that than, than Jesus talks more and if you go through and you watch all the movement in God's people, when the tabernacle was built, if God created the heavens and the earth by just speaking them into existence, that's not what he did for the church of those days, the tabernacle. God told Moses, ask the people. And then when the temple was built in Solomon, Ask the people. And then when it was destroyed and when it was rebuilt, God asked his people for the finances to do that. And you'll never guess 
what our financial responsibility is to the church. And it's biblically based. And I would be irresponsible if I failed to preach on the topic of tithing and how it relates to our spiritual life. It is the giving of God's people which allows God's instrument to transform the world to exist. It's the tithe that we are told to bring into the house of God that provides for the needs and the outreach into our community. It allows us to support programs and ministries, both local and abroad, like Africa University. And I'm hopeful that this message will reveal that we have a special privilege of being able to return a portion of the gifts that God has given us back to Him. And in fact, the scripture that was read this morning by Pam illustrates this truth. Because you see, the Old Testament, God's embodiment of reaching God's people with God's ways was sent by God to to show an example and an illustration of what happens. In verses 6, 7, in chapter 17, verses 8 and 9, and in 1 Kings, we'll find that Elijah is instructed by God to go and live in this village, Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. And he says, guess what? There's going to be a widow in that city that will feed you. The first thing I, when I take that passage apart, I I find that she has this wonderful, incredible opportunity. Been chosen specifically like you and I have been chosen to, to be a part of the work that God is doing. So this widow was chosen specifically to provide for Elijah. Too often, my friends, we see giving as an obligation to God, don't we? I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. You know what? I've got to put a little something in the plate. And we see many of us in the world sees our giving, our tithes, and our offerings to the churches. It's the price we have to pay if we want to have eternal life. But I point out to you this morning that this text in 1 Kings and the prophet Elijah and this widow shows us that giving is an opportunity and not an obligation. You see, we can give out of legalism, but it doesn't do anything. Really what God desires is to give out of liberty. So I want to just take a brief moment, and, and, and I know that it's a little ways away, but, well, I sit with a group of guys Monday mornings and, uh, at Bob Evans, and, and I have the most awful breakfast, uh, but the company is great. Yeah, I, I just heard it's not McDonald's, that's why it's not great. But... Every so often they'll talk about, you know, taxes and this and that that are due, and oh my goodness and gracious, I've never heard of one of them hum a tune, saying, I get to give to the IRS today, hip, hip, hooray. Have you done that? Why? It's out of obligation. It's not a free gift that you're giving. You feel obligated to write that check. You don't have a choice. But giving is different when it's something that you want to do. When you give out of love, whether it's to a child or to a spouse, to a friend, and I would even say to the church, then it becomes different than obligation and it becomes a joy as opposed to a hassle. The same is true when you offer your time and your talent to God, not because it's written down somewhere, not because you've taken a vow, 
but it's because you love God so much that you want to give of yourself, not just your resources and finances, but of your very self. It no longer is a burden and it becomes a privilege because you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Did you catch that? You can give without loving. I can, I can go down and I do not want to be in this place and help these people. But I can't, I can't love unless I'm willing to give of myself. The second thing I see with, with the Old Testament passage is this widow's openness, and she was honest in her evaluation of her financial situation. That's something uncommon today. It's almost like the, the fellow who's lost reality and who said, I, I, I could get ahead if our neighbors would just quit buying things that I can't afford. It's that cult of materialism that has seeped itself into the life of each one of us in some way, shape, or form, and it's, it's rampant in our society. And God says you should give of your very best, and the world says you should have the very best. And too often... We as Christians fall down and worship the almighty dollar right along with everyone else. We have to have the biggest car, the best house, the nicest clothes. In fact, in a previous parish, I was reminded when I was working on this sermon that one of our ushers would always remind the people coming in, don't forget, God wants you to be a success because the, the, the man who dies with the most toys wins. This was one of our ushers. I had some work to do. And I, and, and I have to be honest with each one of you when it comes to giving. I'm sad to say that many of us clergy don't make the mark. And yet we're willing to stand up and, and say, can you please give? Sacrificially. I just need to give a disclosure this morning that Catherine and I tithe to this church. The church that we have the pleasure of serving. Catherine and I tithe to Sunbury UMC. Oh, I've heard the line, you've heard the line. You know what, I'm, uh, I, I, I take less of a pay and uh, what a martyr it is. I've given up what I would look at everything I've given up for the ministry. The sacrifices I make, isn't that enough of a tithe? I deal with young preachers and helping mentor and help them through the process of, of ordination in our annual conference. And I can't tell you how many conversations like that have been brought my way. And I often respond to those who talk and act like that with one simple statement. If you're convinced that it's that bad, then you have three options, my friend. You can accept it and rejoice, much like Paul did. You can change it, grow the church so large that you'll receive a large salary because of the budget that you have, or you can leave it. You see, this woman was honest in what she had. She was honest in what she could give. She tells them and tells Elijah that I don't have much. But, in fact, this was our last meal. 
She was honest. You remember what happened to two individuals and in the lesson that we learned of Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts who were not honest with their giving. We need to be honest with God. And we discover two really neat things. First is that God uses unlikely people, a widow with no means. I would have thought he would have chosen a huge landowner that had resources galore, but no. A widow with only a handful of grain and a little oil in a jar. You may only have a little money in your account. But God still asks us to be faithful. I read a recent survey in the U.S. Uh, uh, in the U.S. done by the Gallup organization showed that almost one half of charitable contributions from households they come from households with annual incomes of less than thirty thousand dollars. Not a lot of money, and yet they give. It's not about how much you have. It's about the choice that you make. We can never say we have too little for God to ever use me. Look at the widow. She had one meal left. Also, God will hold us accountable for what we have. Remember the sermon we had a few weeks ago about, about the, the man who went away and, and gave talents, gave money, $50,000, a year's salary. And they were held responsible for what they had received. God never, has never said that, that we are responsible for all the giving in the village of Sunbury, all the giving in Westerville or Condon or whatever you want to call it. But God is saying we're responsible for giving to the church that serves and that we're part of. The other thing that, that enticed me is that her obligation, she saw it not as an obligation, but as an opportunity. And when she looked at, at the opportunity, she said, yes, the work of God done by a man of God, why wouldn't I want to be a part of that? See, the key to stewardship is that little word first, found in Matthew, the sixth chapter. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things will be added. Too many of us give our leftovers to God. It's at the end of the week when we have an hour free and we say, ah, oh, maybe. I read this story and it's kind of intrigued me. It was a farmer who had two calves, and he said to the preacher, I, I'm going to give one of these calves to the church. That's 50%. One of these calves is going to the church, and you can slaughter it and sell it or whatever the case is to, to help the church. And then about three weeks later, he came, and he said, Preacher, I am so sorry. You remember that storm we had? Well, the church's calf died. Plain and simple that uh, we're called to act in obedience out of joy. I think of all the other times that God's people have been, act to, have been called to act out of joy. And I thought of the times that they said yes when it looked like it was not possible. Some have said it's not possible to to live if I give a tithe. Well, in effect, what we're saying to God is, I don't trust you enough, and I don't think I can make it on the 90% that you've given to me to live on. And I could ask the question, because it's happened to me. It, it's happened to, to one of our family members not too long ago. You know, if your employer said, I'm cutting your pay by 10% tomorrow, would you still be able to live? Well, the answer is yes. But when it comes to God, we say no, we can't do it. The last point is this. When she obeyed and was joyful about it, 
and verse 16 of the 17th chapter of 1 Kings. She had an overflow that she could never imagine. Wow, God came through. Is that a surprise or what? Of course not. I've told you right here from this pulpit that no matter what happens that in our lives, Catherine and my life, we have seen God work time and time and time again through circumstances that we did not know how we were going to get out of. And God just continues to bless, continues to, to provide in ways from, part, uh, from areas that we never, never could imagine. Well, my friends, that's the end of this sermon. Not quite. I don't know if I've told you before, but I, I kind of like McDonald's. If you haven't heard that, please get used to hearing it. Uh, can you put that first slide up? Uh, if you can't see, that's the tie I'm wearing. It's all the french fries coming down from heaven. That's what I choose to believe. And going right into Gordon's large fry. In fact, this is a side note. This is free. I won't charge you for this at all. I think that there was a mistranslation in the Hebrew Bible that when, uh, when manna came down from heaven, it was McManna. <laughs> Don't you tell anybody that I said that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm telling you, this McDonald's has taught me more about what it's like to be a Christian. From a simple perspective, seeing things in fries and burgers has helped me become a Christian, a better Christian, understanding how I can better serve God. Now, how many of you have taken your kids to McDonald's? Okay, so you probably have had the same experience. We go up, we order, and next thing you know, we get to the place, and everybody's getting their order that they got, and next thing you know, Dad, I'm out of fries. Oh, I'm out of fries. Can I have yours? Oh, such love and sacrifice. Show the slide there, Bill. That's what it looks like. Look at that. Everybody's got their own pot. And their pot goes empty and they suffer. And all of a sudden it dawned on me. It, it, was, it, was, it was like a God moment. I said, I've got kids who first and foremost didn't work for these fries. They mismanaged their fries. And on top of that, they didn't even drive themselves to this place, to McDonald's, God's heavenly restaurant. And they're asking me, who, and Catherine, who worked for the money, who got them dressed, provided for their clothes, taught them their manners, drove them to McDonald's, paid for their meal, and then they're saying, they have, not, they have contributed nothing. Some might say they've contributed grief, but I don't count that as anything. They've contributed nothing to this. And then God kind of popped into my mind. What if, Gordon, you had this? Oh, doesn't that look good? We started calling it community fry. I don't care what you ordered, you put your fries in the middle of the plate. And everybody, eat as much as you want. And you know what? We never heard another word about I'm out of fries. We never heard another word about it. My friends, this is the church. We want our little pot here, our little pot there. We never even, God's given it to us. 
Let's put it in the pot, the, the, the community of God pot here at SUMC. And let's allow God to make sure every need is met. Every need, great or small. It might take, it might take different way of thinking about what you, we've got. And it also might mean that we have to let go and be obedient to what God is telling us works. It's been said before, the church doesn't have a money problem, but the church has a giving problem. When it comes to giving, we're not willing to be all in. Is that the next slide? We're not willing to be all in. That Glenn reminded me of that. We're not willing to be all in. It takes a dream to make it happen. It takes a dream. So my friends, I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come forward to receive our tithe while we watch this video. Would you put the video on, Bill? I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. The Eagle has landed. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Friends, it's my dream that we all are committed to the ministries and the support of at Sunbury United Methodist Church. Would you stand with me as we have our prayer of the people this morning? We pray that we may turn to God for guidance and direction as we strive to serve one another and the church with gifts of God that God has entrusted to our care. Open our hearts, Lord, to serve you with joy. 
We pray that we may more easily choose to serve rather than to be served, to give rather than to take, to contribute rather than to consume. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that we may learn to more deeply trust God to provide us with all that we need. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that we may learn to see the difference between the simple things we need and the many things that we want. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that, like the giant, the saints of old, we may say yes to what God calls us to do, always remembering that God has done great things for us. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that through our good stewardship, we may build up God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that we may recognize the many blessings the poor and needy bring to us, even as we seek to share our blessings with them. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that we may come to more fully realize that everything we have is a gift from God, and we are called to generously share these gifts with all who are in need. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that we may learn to see ourselves as God's beloved children who have been called to work in God's kingdom and spread God's love throughout the world. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that we may find more time to pray, to give thanks for all God's blessings, and ask for guidance in best using the gifts entrusted to our care. Open our hearts, Lord. We pray that as we look upon the world, we may see the unseen, love the unlovable, and bind up the brokenhearted wherever we find them. Open our hearts, Lord. Loving God, we come to you in thanksgiving, knowing that, knowing that all we are and all that we have is a gift from you. Speak your words into the depths of our souls that we may hear you clearly. We surrender to you this day all the facets of our lives, whether it be at home, at work, or at school, to be patient, to be merciful, to be generous, to be holy. Give us the wisdom and insight to understand your will for us and the fervor to carry out our good intentions. My friends, this prayer is intended to draw us closer, closer to God and closer to God's ways. Would you remain standing as we sing, Draw Me Close?
please join me now in the sending, which is responsive. God of lavishness, you have fed us with, with your holy words. Christ of abundance, you have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit of generosity, that, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in, in the risen life.
my friends, go out with the joy and knowledge knowing that Christ walks with us, Christ provides for us, and that Christ will always be in our lives. Go in peace, my friends.